Okay, this talk is about the suppression of dissent against Einstein according to John Chappell. Uh, there have been various dissenters against Einstein's relativity, for instance Herbert Dingle. This is on Wikipedia, Herbert Dingle. English physicist and natural philosopher who served as president of the World Astronomical Society from 1951 to 1953. He's best known for his opposition to Einstein's special theory of relativity and the attractive uh, controversy that this provoked. He passed away in 1978 and this uh, opposition to Einstein has still been ongoing. Uh, but not much in the way of organised group of like-minded people that Einstein's relative is wrong happened at the time of Herbert Engel. Uh, John Chappell started to organise such a group. So here's, here's John Chappell here, who's also passed away unfortunately, and he set up a group of people to oppose Einstein's relativity. Actually it's a natural philosophies group where they allow different points of view but a large part of that group is a dissent against Einstein. So next we go to one of his talks. This is a talk by John Chappell in 1992 and this is only sort of recently been put on the internet. More of this sort of stuff is getting put onto the internet. More and more stuff saying that Einstein is wrong. So the group of people, us, group of people who say that Einstein is wrong, we're starting to grow. So this is a meeting he set up and the people in the establishment who mainly people who are in support of Einstein's relativity decided not to come to this meeting where people would say that Einstein's wrong. So, so the people who believe in Einstein uh, believe things like Einstein's special relativity has been proven or confirmed or at least agrees with experiments. And from the point of view of people like us and John Chappell, no, Einstein's relativity is wrong, so they're sort of like deluded about things. They're actually making, those people who believe in Einstein are actually making false claims about experiments. They are interpreting experiments incorrectly. I'll try to soften my evaluation a bit by adding some humor now and then, but I'm afraid even this humor may be lost on dedicated proponents of special theory. Some may find it humorous that I should even try to make a case against special relativity in 20 minutes. But that's all the time I have, and I am supplementing my talk with these handouts, the yellow and green ones, which I urge you to pick up. And of course, there'll be time to cover a lot more ground in this afternoon's debate. Now, if Unfortunately, I don't have these handouts, so just going by what he's saying in this talk. It's, it's seriously wrong with special relativity. A skeptic might wonder why the appropriate counter arguments have not been widely published and discussed. Well, they haven't because the academic establishment has not allowed them to be. Yeah, so the academic establishment, mainly people who are believers in Einstein, and they've uh, managed to suppress dissent against Einstein. It has, dissent against Einstein has managed to get through now and again, but they managed to suppress most of it. They've not allowed there to be an open debate between them, those people who believe in Einstein, 
with the people who say Einstein is wrong. The thought control protecting the special theory from criticism has been thorough and harsh. Morally as well as intellectually speaking, this censorship may well be the most indefensible in all the history of science and philosophy. So this, this, censor, this censorship, the people who believe in Einstein's relativity are censoring people who don't believe in it. They're not allowing an open debate between us. It isn't just that neo-Newtonian submissions to the standard physics... So what he's talking about is neo-Newtonian physics. And what we have is uh, Einstein becoming famous in 1919. And that was, so say, replacing Newtonian physics by what Einstein's talking about. And most of us who say Einstein's wrong, like John Chappelle, well, we, we want to bring back Newtonian physics. So then it's sort of like new Newtonian physics or neo-Newtonian physics uh, undo the damage that Einstein has done. So the now criticising the education process in science, particularly physics, where they don't encourage students to have critical thinking. If you had critical thinking and applied it to what Einstein's talking about, then you should reach the idea that Einstein's talking nonsense. And I've actually dealt with that in quite a few of my videos. I'm saying the process that Einstein goes through is cuckoo. It doesn't make any sense in this one. And this one, like this video, pointing out that when you read Einstein, it should be accepted that as a valid conclusion that Einstein's talking nonsense. He just doesn't make any sense. But this is not the what the education process wants to allow its students. It doesn't want its students to come to that conclusion, and so it's trying to enforce upon them uh, the dogma of Einstein's uh, relativity. The weeding out process is those people who accept Einstein's relativity are the ones that are going on to become the professors that teach the next generation and those that are too critical of Einstein, but they're just being weeded out. During my graduate study I overheard an elementary physics class being chastised by its instructor for daring to offer non-relativistic explanations to certain experiments. So that's, that's the situation. You've got these, so say, experiments that are supporting Einstein's relativity, and they're not allowing the students to really uh, discuss the issue. There are other, or other ways of interpreting those experiments other than Einstein's relativity, and that would be part of uh, critical thinking to the students. Be taught. Oh, there's other ways to interpret the experiments. So when these. Uh, really devout believers in Einstein's relativity come along and saying we've got all these experiments that uh, support Einstein. No it doesn't. Those experiments can be interpreted other ways. Not long before that a physicist in the same department had threatened to destroy my doctoral program if I dared to write a thesis critical of special relativity, even though the thesis would be a history of science on his department. In the late 1940s, a certain undergraduate physics major at Harvard figured out how to explain the so-called proofs of general relativity in terms of Newtonian physics. His advisor did not refute his results, but simply advised him to find another major. Many more similar examples could be cited. So those are, those are examples of the weeding out process. Uh, they don't want students to realize that uh, you don't really need Einstein's relativity. Chairman, even though he knew what I was up to, allowed me to open 
a six-hour Einstein centennial session with an unscheduled criticism of special relativity. You may smile at the utter incredulity of this episode, but the AAAS officials were not amused. They quickly withdrew from sale the audio tapes for the session and then extended their multi-year record of refusing to allow any scheduled session of Neonatonian papers at their national meetings. But change is now in the air. So, <clears throat> so that's the sort of examples of the way the believers in Einstein managed to s suppress criticism. So, it's quite awful. And he's now saying that th you think John Chappelle is thinking things are changing from 1992, but really I think they've stalled a bit. And the people who are dissenting against Einstein have really only slowly been growing. And there's still been an ongoing suppression by the mainstream. Whenever there is now and again a breakthrough where some something critical of Einstein is uh, published or so forth in the mainstream, but they try to still keep trying to suppress things as much as they can. Neonatonian research meetings and dissident publications have been increasing exponentially for the past several years. When he's talking about neo-Newtonian physics, what we've got is what you really want is a return to Newtonian physics. Einstein became famous in 1919, and it's so so physics then changed from Newtonian physics to what Einstein was talking about. So most of us who dissent against Einstein want a return to Newtonian physics. The Leningrad meeting was only the most prominent event in all this. A movement that for decades has been forced underground is now about to work its way into prominence with hundreds if not thousands of active researchers in its ranks. Hard to tell how many because of the silence of the, the uh, censorship that keeps people unaware of everything that's happening. Anyway, it seems to me an especially hopeful sign that the same AAAS has now opened its doors to us here at this Pacific Division meeting. Now, the type of flawed thinking responsible for special relativity... So it's flawed thinking for special relativity. So, from the point of view of us distance, like uh, John Chappell, it's all based upon flawed thinking. Einstein's relativity is all flawed thinking. And, of course, you've got philosophy behind that flawed thinking. And it's going to be pointed out it is positivism. And positivism, as per Wikipedia, is the philosophy of science that information derived from logical and mathematical treatments and reports of sensory experience is the exclusive source of all authoritative knowledge. And there is other philosophies of science and what you've got with uh, students is they're not, if they're just doing physics, then they don't really get taught much of philosophy of science. And so they're just left to develop their own philosophy. And in the way it's been taught to them, the physics has been taught to them, they end up with believing this sort of philosophy normally. And they're not really aware that that's the philosophy they're believing. And the history of this philosophy goes back before Einstein to people like Ernest Mack, this is from Wikipedia as well, and he was an Austrian physicist and philosopher, noted for his contributions to physics such as the Mach number and the study of shock waves. As a philosopher of science he was a major influence on logical positivism, American pragmatism, and through his criticism Newton, a forerunner of Einstein's relativity. See, so you've got all this flawed thinking based upon a philosophy, namely a positivism. And John Chappelle's going to go into this now. We divide it into, into two categories, formal and transformal. The formal problems involve history, philosophy, and empirical evidence. These categories overlap and are most appropriately treated together. About a century ago, physics began to be dominated by Machian positivism. This approach was marked by deep suspicion of metaphysics and of speculation in general and by the notion of hard empirical evidence. Mach was so suspicious of what he could not sense directly that he doubted even the atomic theory of matter, not to mention Newtonian time and space. But rather paradoxically, by the late 20th century, the term positivism has come to mean in the social as well as the natural sciences an approach more involved with mathematics and theorizing than with a close focus on empirical evidence. And even more paradoxically, the kind of physics that has lately evolved out of positivism and operationalism is marked by wild flights of fanciful speculation, often totally devoid of any empirical basis. Physicists now talk seriously of multidimensional spaces, but one-dimensional superstrings. And I feel like that would be George Carlin up here. One-dimensional superstrings. Uh, at least until recently.
recently were in, they were in thrall with particles of superluminal velocity deduced by means of assuming that time can flow backwards. But these ideas aren't really much more fantastic than others for which they do claim solid empirical support, such as curved space, time dilation, and space contraction. An ordinary educated person looking in on this from outside may easily be tempted to accuse physicists of dealing more in science fiction than in real science. And perhaps not so coincidentally, a few years ago I noticed... So what we have is Einstein's general relativity, but you've got things like uh, warp space-time and all these fantasy ideas. It gets put into science fiction and things like Star Trek, where you have uh, warp drives, where you warp in space and time, uh, and all that sort of thing. And it's all just fantastical stuff, and so it all becomes seductive in a way. about 12 times as many books on science fiction as on science. But any non-physicist who expresses such doubts out loud is likely to be accused of being mired in outdated common sense. And so it's, uh, if you're criticizing all the scientific fantasy, uh, you, you, you get uh, accused of having outdated common sense. And so this is one of the problems with Einstein. Einstein, 1919, becomes famous. And he's overthrowing, so say, Newtonian physics. And so Newtonian physics, you could say, has its common sense. So he's overthrowing uh, Newtonian physics' common sense. And so you're then going over to these people who believe in Einstein and then going over into what Einstein's talking about. And it's an abandonment of that common sense. And they seem to be happy to abandon common sense. But when you sort of like look at what they're talking about from common sense of Newtonian physics, you end up saying, well, it just doesn't make any sense what they're doing. It's a cuckoo process. It's nonsense, basically. This is what the main problem is. You're looking at what Einstein's talking about from a common sense point of view based on Newtonian physics, and Einstein's just talking nonsense. And if we go to the philosophy, the philosophy is positivism, and based upon that positivism, people are sort of like trying to defend Einstein by saying, yeah, of course you abandon common sense, which is just nonsense. As if he or she were just as naive as some pre columbian believer in a flat earth. The genuine common sense, which I take to involve an honest mixture of, mixture of logic, respect for the evidence of the senses, and perhaps also intuition, defined as a logical guess about the unknown based upon the known, is much more valid and useful than today's typical physicist who is so anxious to claim insights not available to ordinary people wants to admit. Genuine common sense, along with its scholarly extensions in terms of formal logic, theory of perception, and the like, has indeed been left on the sidelines during the transition from early 20th century positivism, which I think was a healthy attitude in its own time, to the current era of wildly non-empirical speculation and physics is much the quarter for it. In terms of the original rise of Machian positivism, the trouble is that an obsessive concentration on sense evidence is not enough by itself to provide the kind of results that physicists want. They will reach for generalization and theories anyway. And if their worldview tells them that metaphysics, logic, and philosophy in general are not important, then they are likely to do their reaching in a careless and invalid manner. manner. What it all boils down to is that you cannot do science without also doing philosophy. Science cannot even begin without affirming, at least implicitly, the basic premise of philosophical realism, that there is a world outside of ourselves that we can study. So basically what you're really saying is rejection of this uh, philosophy of positivism, where's it gone, positivism here. Uh, positivism is a sort of like philosophy which has been taken up now based upon Einstein's relativity as being the philosophy that many people of science are going by and it's a total corruption of science really from our point of view an abandonment of common sense and so forth it makes it nonsense and then, then based upon the flawed thinking that Einstein has what happens is it's misinterpretation of experiments and he actually goes into details about that so you should need, need to look on to that so I'm picking up for the next point though 
So he's picking up after he's pointed out the experiments that so say confirm his special relativity have been misinterpreted based upon this law of thinking. Get to this. There's a lot of uh, acceleration going on, which is supposed to be outside the range of the realm of special relativity. There are many other experiments part of the total story. All are unequivocal at best, and usually totally misconstrued or poorly conducted or both. Yeah. Wallace Cantor of San Diego published a book in 1976 going through 65 of these experiments and finding crucial flaws in every one. So you've got one of the critics of Einstein relativity going through the experiments that are supposed to be confirming Einstein's relativity and they're finding they're all flawed. Establishment physicists don't do this kind of critique. They don't examine experiments critically. They don't so this is the criticism about these people who are supporters of Einstein. They're not actually looking at the experiments that they're talking about critically. And when you look at the experiments critically, which they're saying support Einstein, you find out that those experiments don't. So they're just making, f these people who support Einstein are just making false claims about experiments. ...the experimental report to follow step by step from the data to the announced result. If the result suits them, they just accept it uncritically. What is worse, their knowledge of the history of experimental work is often so bad that they misrepresent even the announced results bringing them closer to their own frequency. I.e. they're misrepresenting experiments. These people who believe in Einstein are misrepresenting experiments. You know, Stephen Hardath, a Hordath, a UCSB physiologist, said So there you go. So Scientific American, as an example, is publishing something which is wrong, and he's telling them what they publish is wrong, and they won't, Scientific American won't correct themselves. They're just letting it stand. Then these science articles from the people who believe in Einstein's relativity are just making false claims, and when when you when people like us criticise them that these then then they're not going to correct their articles, they just didn't let it stand with all these false claims in there. Now we don't have time to go into alternative theories, there's quite a few of them. They're usually either ether theories or additive velocity theories. I myself believe we can have both features in the same theory, but I'm not going to go into how I would do that right now. There are a plethora of alternatives to special relativity, but this in itself does not render special relativity invalid any more than the multitude of JFK assassination conspiracy theories makes the Warren Report valid. At least, all theoreticians do realize something is seriously wrong with special relativity. Most reject it completely. This really isn't uh, all that difficult for those who are not intimidated by prestige and power. Building an alternative theory, however, is tough. But the toughest problem of all, I think, is to try to explain how so profound an error has persisted for so long. Still, it goes on. A psycho psychological and sociological problem is what we're really looking at here. We're talking about Kuhn's idea of the irrational basis for paradigm choice, which he may have sensed was a valid concept, perhaps subconsciously, because he was so fairly trained in physics himself. At any rate, uh, what are the reasons behind this irras the irrational basis of this paradigm choice? It's hard to know for sure. I think a desire for privileged knowledge, as I indicated before, is part of it. Physicists want to believe they can know something that ordinary people can't know easily. A desire for bizarre and strange concepts is another part of it. The hyper-development of the concept of change that has gradually taken over the intellectual world in the West uh, began with Darwin and his 
we lose all faith in stable concepts and everything seems elusive. That's probably part of it too. So that's speculative. I'm not going to go any further with it right now. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry. I went a little... So there you go. That's the end of the talk. So um, he's next going to do questions and answers, but which I want to go into. So basically, you've got with the people who are supporting or the believers in Einstein's relativity, those people are misrepresenting experiments and they're saying things that are false and they're not correcting themselves and they are refusing to have an open debate with people who are dissenting against Einstein's relativity. And when you do get uh, articles published and talks into the into the mainstream based on saying Einstein is wrong then those people who are supporters of Einstein are doing their best to try to remove that as much as possible it's just suppression and so in 1992 John Chappell thought things were starting to change a bit but unfortunately things have stalled and it's still only a slow process of growing more and more people uh, of dissenters against Einstein's relativity. Thank you. That's the end.